Hello, everyone. Um, I'm, uh, for those of you who don't know me yet, I'm Wilfred Mausbach. I'm the executive director here at the HCA. Um, uh, and I'm happy to uh, welcome you to tonight's uh, book launch. Uh, uh, book launch is a particular format that we um, established here many years ago at the HCA um, with the idea to um, present to our students, but also the broader public, um, what we are actually doing here. Um, and we um, tended to include um, those of um, those who are uh, in any way connected to the HCA. Um, and luckily, um, as most of you know, uh, one of these uh, tentacles, so to speak, reaches over the Neckar River into the Neuenheimer Feld, um, where the Department of Geography is uh, uh, situated. Um, and uh, uh, that is also kind of uh, one of the specialties here at the HCA. I think um, we are right now the only American Studies Center in Germany that has a geography's uh, professor um, uh, with um, Ulrike Gerhardt uh, from over there. And we are uh, very, uh, and that's been a very productive um, uh, cooperation. Uh, and so I'm uh, delighted uh, to have uh, another colleague, a uh, rather newer colleague from uh, the Department uh, of Geography here um, in the person of Natalie Koch. Um, and I must admit that I first noticed um, uh, her when the Department of Geography sent us their courses um, uh, to include in our program a few semesters back. And there was an announcement uh, of a class about Arizona titled after her book, Arid Empire. And my first thought was, great, we need to do an excursion. <laughs> only to find out that it was too late because she'd already planned one. Um, but I trust there will be ample opportunities for future cooperation. Um, so um, in order to very briefly introduce her, Natalie Koch, as I said, is a professor of human geography at uh, Heidelberg University now. She holds a PhD in geography from the University of Colorado Boulder, a master's in geography from the University um, uh, no, that was, I got it wrong, right? A PhD in geography from uh, Boulder, yeah, a master's also from Boulder, right? Um, and a bachelor's in geography and Russian area studies from Dartmouth College. Uh, Dr. Koch has published extensively in journals such as Political Geography, Environmental Politics, uh, Geoform, Geopolitics, and Historical Geography, and she's editor of uh, three books, including last year's Spatializing Authoritarianism, Syracuse University Press. Um, her first book, The Geopolitics of Spectacle, Space, Sinek Dark, and The New Capitals of Asia, published with Cornell University Press in 2018, is now followed by her new monograph, Arid Empire, The Entangled Fates of Arizona and Arabia, uh, published now with Verso uh, this year, right? Um, so building from this research on the role of arid lands, expertise in US empire building domestically and overseas, uh, Professor Koch's next book project will focus on the wider history of US science diplomacy in the Gulf region, also um, an exciting topic, but today we're going to take a closer look um, at this just published book. Um, for, um, and for the event, uh, Dr. Koch has assembled a veritable rooster of distinguished commentators um, on her book. I'll leave it to her um, to introduce uh, them in due course, um, but I can't refrain from identifying two of them in advance. Um, one of them uh, is Robert Lee, um, who is uh, actually an alumnus of the first class of the master's program that we did here at uh, the HCA back in the early 2000s. Um, and, 
after detours uh, at Berkeley, Harvard, and now as a lecturer at Cambridge universities, I'm happy that he uh, was able uh, to return uh, back here. So that's uh, very fortunate. Um, welcome back, I can say. And the second one is uh, right in front of me. It's Katrin Gerstorf, who for a long time uh, was, uh, or who was the executive director of the German Association for American Studies when the HCA was hosting the association's annual meeting uh, in 2021. And it was a really enjoyable and productive uh, cooperation. So, Katrin, I'm happy uh, to have you back here um, at the HCA. And actually, um, uh, the meeting in 2021, of course, was online. Uh, so um, we unfortunately weren't able to have um, kind of everyone here. Um, so with that, uh, I thank you all for coming. And I turn it over uh, to Natalie Koch. Uh, welcome. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for, for being here uh, and for joining me to celebrate a, a, an exciting project and also with a number of colleagues, uh, including the, the panelists who helped me think through many of these questions uh, over the last years of the project. Uh, but first, I'd like to make visible the invisible labor of the human geography colleagues uh, who helped organize this event, especially Ms. Brigitte Heine, uh, without whom it would not have been possible. Um, I'm also grateful for the support of our student assistants, Caroline Schneider, Alisa Kegel, Stephanie Wieber, and Anna Hoffmann. Uh, thank you for all of your help in, in um, bringing, bringing all of our guests here and supporting us. Um, as well as for the HCA student assistants. I haven't met them all yet, uh, but I understand that they have been working miracles in the background, so thank you for your work. Uh, thanks also to Anya Schuller and, and the rest of the HCA team for their assistance in hosting, uh, such a, it, hosting us in such a wonderful venue, uh, and also to all of the guests who have made the, made the trip here this evening, and including some people from very far over an ocean, perhaps. Um, I really feel honored and humbled to have such an amazing group of, of scholars joining us today, and I look forward to many, many uh, wonderful discussions in the future. So in organizing this event, I think it's, it's fantastic that HCA has a book launch um, uh, experience, but I've learned that book launches are not all that common in Germany, uh, which is good for me in a way because I never really wanted to have a standard, <laughs> a standard event of what a book launch would be, which I mostly just imagine uh, me talking and other people listening. Rather, I wanted to have a conversation with colleagues from diverse backgrounds uh, about the questions that perplex me in writing Arid Empire uh, and that I continue to struggle with today. So what I would like to do in opening uh, is to read some excerpts from the first chapter of the book to give you a sense of some of those bigger questions uh, and then turn the floor over to our, our wonderful colleagues. So the book begins. On a cool, December day in 2019, I pulled into the parking lot of a small cemetery in Quartzsite, Arizona. As I stepped into the wind, I saw what I was looking for. Hi Jolly's tomb, a stone pyramid just about six feet tall with a bronze camel silhouette perched on top. The placard from 1935 reads, the last camp of Hi Jolly, born somewhere in Syria about 1828, died at Quartzsite, December 16, 1902. Came to this country February 10, 1856. Camel driver, packer, scout, over 30 years of faithful aid to the US government. Few people in Arizona know the history or the story of Hai Jolly, uh, but he was, an he was originally sent to the American Southwest in the 1850s after the army picked him up, along with dozens of camels from the Ottoman Empire. The army's goal with its camel corpse project uh, was to test the viability of <clears throat> uh, to test the viability of Middle Eastern camels in establishing military control of the desert southwest, shortly after the territories had been added following the Mexican-American War uh, in 1848. 
the US Army had no one in its ranks who knew how to manage the camels, so it imported a cohort of cameleers as well. Uh, most of Hijali's Ottoman companions had lied, as it turns out, about their camel expertise to get free passage to uh, the Americas. But not Hajali, uh, actually an expert camelier. He was deemed a faithful aide to the US government, just as the placard claims, ensuring the success of the Camel Corps project and advancing the army's effort to colonize the desert Southwest. A 19th century army experiment with camels may not seem uh, that relevant to big questions of empire and geopolitics today. But as my book shows, the uh, obscured entanglement of Arizona and Arabia's development offers important lessons about the people, ideas, institutions, and the cultural imaginings of empire. A far-reaching structure of settlement and extraction at work at home and abroad in the past and still today. In this light, Hajali's tomb is anything but a quirky footnote to American history. It is a place that opens up new perspectives on U.S. settler colonialism, overseas empire, and our colonial present. Like Hajali's tomb, arid empire exists today. To see arid empire, to bring it into focus, we need to examine what I see as the political lives of deserts. In the U.S. Southwest, arid empire is partly about the dispossession, expulsion, and extermination of indigenous communities from these desert lands. But it is also about how the American settlers have told and continue to tell stories about the desert as a place of strength and opportunity, how these stories are put to work in the name of science, the state, and many other agendas. Even as Arizona's early settlers mastered the skills of colonizing the desert, they did not stop there. They took that imperial know-how back to Arabia, shifting from serving America's empire building at home to helping expand its empire overseas. In this global circuitry and in the story of arid empire, the very idea of the desert becomes a resource. Understanding the political lives of deserts is thus to understand how people tap into this narrative resource, how they breathe life into their stories of the desert, how they put those stories to work through the constellation of desires and beliefs that, the foundation, that are the foundation of arid empire. Arid empire exists today in another sense, in the lives of descendants of empire like myself. Growing up in Tucson, Arizona in the 1980s and 90s, I was not taught the violent history of Arizona's colonization. Even as I moved through my career to become a geography professor, I never reflected on how it was that I had come to see Arizona as somehow mine. I understood the colonial origins of the United States intellectually, but I never directly confronted my personal place in this history and what it meant to be a settler or a descendant of white settlers today. It was ultimately my academic studies of the deserts in the Middle East that led me back to deeper questions about Arizona's colonization and forced me to reckon with the fact that I had been raised on mythology. I learned Arizona from family trips to the iconic places of the Wild West, Tombstone, Bisbee, and the old Tucson studios where so many cowboy films have been filmed, and where uh, colonialism is transformed into thrilling tales of um, Arizona's unruly heroes. From a young age, my brother and I would dutifully don our cowboy and cowgirl attire for Tucson's annual uh, February rodeo, hay rides, and birthday parties, and anything else that demanded Western flair. Of course, our lives didn't remotely resemble the Wild West, but the Wild West romantic theater was a natural, naturalized part of my childhood home. But as Lakota scholar and activist Nick Estes once remarked, when you say the Wild West, you are talking about genocide. It was at the end of a gun and a bayonet that US democracy was built. Estes is right, of course, but my cowgirl upbringing was not only built at the altar of violence sanitized and sanctified, it was also built through positive associations with the land. As a child, I would spend hours roaming around the desert, outside my house collecting cactus and plant specimens and building forts in the thick mesquite underbrush. I learned the textures of the desert flora and its rocky terrain. I understood the animals and their movements well. 
I came to know and feel the flavor of the uh, Sonoran Desert, and I reveled in it too. As I started to chase High Jolly and the camels through the desert's history, I was forced to admit that my love for Arizona's landscapes never was and never could be innocent. Of course, I couldn't call any other soil or mountains or valleys home. I was born and raised in this place. But I was also born into the structure of American settler colonialism that cast me as an actor in the theater of much longer and larger debates about whose native soil Arizona really was. The power of arid empire, I came to realize, rested in how it could make these myths and structures invisible. Visiting Hyjali's tomb was one way for me to locate, to see this history. And when I went in 2019, I encountered a desert landscape full of hippie rock collectors and off-the-land white nationalists alike, zooming around the desert on all-terrain vehicles. It was hard to imagine them replaced with high jolly astride a hulking camel traversing the rocky terrain. But thinking about high jolly in this landscape, a place where his tomb reminds us he served as a faithful aide to the U.S. government, forced me to ask if I am an unconscious agent of empire as well. Cowboy Kitsch and Hollywood ready-made uh, landscapes helped me to experience Arizona history as a guilt-free space of fantasy, completely divorced from the political questions of how uh, Arizona became part of the United States and how a white person like me came to call it home. I cannot blame anyone for my happy childhood as a cowgirl. I suppose in that picture, not so happy. <laughs> But by learning to apply this retrospective lens of arid empire, as High Jolly's tomb begs us to do, I have come to understand this colonial structure that I was born into. My early romance with the desert is not guilt-free. It is an achievement. It is the result of a calculated effort of generations of settlers who created the conditions for me to call Arizona home, to call Tucson home, and to personally live out their vision of civilization in this desert. As a way of seeing, Arid Empire forces me, forces all of us, to ask how this colonial project was built on fictional stories about the desert, and on real ones too. The book sets out to understand the history of arid empire binding Arizona and Arabia, refracted not just across time and space, but also bodies and lives. Reflecting on my own place in this history, I cannot escape the brutal reality of white supremacy and territorial dispossession that is the United States and my home state of Arizona nor the reality that America's domestic empire helped structure its international empire building in the Middle East over the past century. But with a dose of curiosity and openness to surprise, I've sought to refuse arid empire's politics of invisibility and find the fissures that might allow a new politics of visibility to peek through. By learning to see Arid Empire, I need not be that little cowgirl cast as an actor in someone else's colonial theater. Today, I have more choices than being ventriloquized or silenced. I can unravel my expectations of history, my own fantasies of good and evil, and just maybe know the dif desert differently, camels and all. So I will um, stop there. As I said, that's just some parts of the of the opening chapter, and I think give you gives you a sense of um, the, the the way that this was really truly for me a passion project. Um, and and I again, I'm I'm so grateful that you all are here to uh, to be in conversation with uh, with me about the book and some of the ideas that it might have provoked for you as well. And as I said, these are ideas that I'm still very much working through. Um, so what I would like to do, I because we have a large group, I've just put people's <laughs> names and affiliations here so you all can follow along, make notes when you want to reference uh, their excellent ideas and look up their work, um, but also to give us a sense of, of who's up next. Um, so since uh, uh, Bobby, uh, Bobby Lee or Robert Lee uh, has, has also had a, a kind introduction already, if he's comfortable starting, then we will have, uh, we will have have Dr. Lee from the University of uh, Cambridge University get us started. So the floor is yours. Thank you.
Hi. Uh, yeah, Robert Lee, please call me Bobby. Uh, first, some thank yous. Uh, thank you to Natalie for inviting me and allowing me to read uh, Arid Empire in the run-up to its release. It's really a privilege to be here and to be able to do that and to offer some thoughts about what I think it means for uh, potential directions in the study of U.S. history, particularly the study of uh, land-grant universities, which I'm going to focus some of my comments today on. Um, I also want to echo the thanks uh, to Brigitte and to Caro for showing me the ropes uh, on the train station, at the train station yesterday. Um, I'm also grateful to be at the HCA, or I should say back at the HCA, as you all just heard. Uh, I was in one of the first classes here back in 2007 as a master's student. I've been sort of buzzing around this place. I came to the Spring Academy some years after that when I was a PhD student um, a couple of years ago during the, well, uh, in, the, in the pandemic, um, I zoomed in to a class to discuss a, a book that they were reading, and I spoke for way too long, and I promise not to do that uh, tonight. Um, but I'm really happy to be offering these comments in person because I've only ever met Natalie before online, which happens a lot these days, but in a meeting that is really relevant, uh, I think, to Arid Empire. So we met at a faculty working group uh, looking at the University of Arizona's uh, history as a land-grant university. This is one of many similar investigations going on at a number of universities, at Cornell, at MIT, um, at Ohio State, at University of Minnesota, others. A lot of places are looking into this. And I was there because I had published a, a, a project called Land Grab Universities in 2020 that had excavated some of this history of how U.S. land-grant universities, including the University of Arizona, which is at the center of Arid Empire, um, how they were funded by the Morrill Act of 1862, um, arguing that these universities are built um, not just on indigenous land, um, but with indigenous land that had been capitalized. So the point at which uh, Natalie's work and my own interest intersect, I think you can tell from the reading uh, that we just heard, is, our, uh, is in questions about uh, the significance of the fact that as Arid Empire's uh, introduction puts it, the US colonization of North America was built on the idea that land and resources are wealth. Um, so that idea that land and resources are wealth, wealth up for grabs by imperial powers and redirected towards its interests. Um, that's where I'm going to focus my comments today. Um, it's certainly one of the themes that Arid Empire can help us uh, think about in new ways. Um, this is not to overlook other themes. As you see, you're going to hear from uh, experts in a lot of other areas, so I'll leave those other uh, issues to more capable hands. And it's certainly not um, the only reason to read Arid Empire. You know, as an aside, probably the first reason to read this book is simply because you're going to learn a lot uh, that's going to blow your mind about the connections between uh, the American Southwest uh, and the Middle East. As a historian of the 19th century American West, I'm kind of embarrassed uh, to admit that I had never heard of those Camel Corps uh, that you just heard about from the 1850s, and I'm going to shamelessly build a lecture around it if I ever get to run a course on the American West in the world. Um, I'm probably even more embarrassed that I was familiar with Biosphere 2, which we also hear a lot about. I was probably about 14 when this was all over the news uh, in the United States, and now Arid Empire uh, comes along and tells me not just about its links to Dune and uh, to the Omani irrigation systems, um, but that I totally fell for the techno-futurist PR back in the 90s. Um, so relatedly, if I'm able to make one criticism today, it's that I, uh, I did not see one mention uh, in this book of Biodome, the 1996 comedy starring Pauly Shore and Stephen Baldwin, uh, inspired by Biosphere 2, which I may or may not have owned on VHS. You know, uh, Critics at the time called it inept in every respect, which actually made it a lot more like Biosphere 2 uh, than, we, than we imagined. Uh, so to be fair, fair, maybe its absence uh, is probably another reason to read this book. But let me get back to land and colonization and American history. That's a topic that I flatter myself uh, in thinking that I know something about, and it's a topic Arid Empire can help those of us researching in this area find new directions to go in. 
So as I mentioned, there's a growing interest in the grants that help many land-grant universities get started. These grants weren't just about providing land for campuses. They instead provided large land endowments that could be sold or leased to raise operating funds for universities. Um, these funds provided universities with seed money. Institutions like the University of Arizona were products, in other words, of the expansion of the United States and beneficiaries of the systematic uh, dispossession of indigenous nations. You can learn a lot about these grants in chapter two of this book on uh, date palm agriculture, agricultural exchanges. Um, so conventionally, the Morrill Act, the Hatch Act, some other laws that dealt in these grants, they were seen as federal donations. Um, but of course they weren't, they were redistributions uh, of land. Um, but they were conceptualized, they were narrated as, uh, as free land, as manna from heaven. So historians have started to look at these grants and uh, look at this sort of narrative sleight of hand, uh, and they started thinking that um, half the story was left out, right? The indigenous side of this story. And what Arid Empire shows us uh, is that we've left a lot more than just half out. There's a lot more missing here. Um, I just want to make three quick points because I don't have much time. Um, and uh, these areas that I want to emphasize are in one, um, expertise, two, uh, environmental impact, and three, I really wanted to think of another E word, but I couldn't, um, so I'm going to say global connections. Uh, so first of all, what we see in Arid Empire are examples of how colonial extraction produced not just endowments, but the expertise of universities, which in turn facilitated uh, the further maintenance of US imperial power. Natalie calls it, quote, a resource of sorts, expertise that could be extracted, sought after, controlled. This is, this is uh, especially true in arid places uh, where American settlers saw wastelands in Tracy Boyle's terms um, and sought to mold them into sites for agricultural industries. Arid Empire suggests, I think, that these sites sort of magnified that tendency, makes them hyper visible, uh, but I think we could do very well um, to start looking at expertise in other climates, um, in other industries connected to land grant universities. Relatedly, land grants go beyond endowments to shape environments. This is, uh, this is above ground in terms of date farming and alfalfa farming, uh, but it's also below ground too. The University of Arizona, for instance, is among those land-grant universities that still benefit from leased land. Those lands are leased for natural resource extraction, um, oil and gas. Raising the question of how we, how we balance providing public education for current students with cost imposed on future generations from extracting fossil fuels today. I think this is especially critical, again, in the American Southwest and in the Middle East, where the effects of climate change loom very large. Finally, Arid Empire demands that those of us studying uh, the history of land-grant universities set aside our parochial national view and take a global perspective. Um, this is a general problem for historians, I think. It's, I think it's a, it's a big problem for historians of the United States in particular. Uh, I would include myself uh, in that group. Um, those of us interested in U.S. land-grant universities have really dropped the ball when it comes to asking why these institutions, uh, capital formations, might have international ramifications or create connections overseas. And we see those possibilities really on, on dazzling display here in this book. So expertise, environmental impact, and global connections um, at land-grant universities. Um, that's where I hope historians picking up Arid Empire will look next. Thanks. Good evening, um, um, and thank you for Natalie for inviting me here um, to speak about your book, um, which I found really interesting. And I have to admit, I'm a little nervous um, to speak in a scholarly capacity about the desert because it hasn't been for almost 15 years that I have done so. Um, 15 years, approximately 15 years ago, my own desert book was published, which for the Germans um, in here was my, um, the outcome of my Habilitationsschrift. 
um, which I had actually started in, at the end, at the very end of the last century. Um, and uh, since then I have moved on, uh, on to other territories, um, uh, forests being among them. I guess uh, I found the desert too dry after all. Um, <clears throat> But um, uh, what's really interesting uh, is that um, um, some of the, the, um, the anecdotes and some of the, the, um, um, the characteristics that I found in your book, um, I have also come across uh, while I was doing my research. Um, uh, in Tucson, Arizona, I spent there the uh, winter of 2001 and 2002, flew in there one week after 9-11, which was really interesting, it was the first flight um, um, to the United States, uh, and spent a wonderful uh, winter doing research there. And one of my starting points for, for um, uh, thinking and writing about the desert was actually an essay by a professor in Romance literature, Romance studies, whose name I now um, whose name escapes me, um, who said that for the end um, of the 20th century, uh, the American desert is as symbolically important as the Eiffel Tower was for the end of the 19th century, the previous previous founder Siegler. So technology, on the one hand, and landscape environment um, um, symbolism on the on the other hand. Uh, my original training um, disciplinary background is in literary studies, um, and so I embarked on this project as a literary studies scholar, but soon realized that I ha also have to go uh, poach in other areas. Uh, human geography was certainly one, uh, cultural history uh, was another. Um, and some of the, um, the aspects that Natalie writes about in her book um, I have come across and decided not to include in my book. So I was really happy to find the camel story again and in some more detail um, in your book. So thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and also the story about Biosphere 2, which I ended up visiting, actually. Um, and one of the, the, the interesting things uh, about Biosphere 2, for those of you um, um, who are not that familiar with it, um, uh, basically they... Um, uh, reconstructed all um, the ecologies that uh, planet Earth, so to speak, Biosphere 1 has. And uh, interestingly, uh, the one that collapsed first was the desert. So, uh, so the desert uh, seems to be the most difficult um, um, ecosystem to reconstruct. Um, but that was, uh, again, also something that I uh, did not end up including in my book in which I looked at discourses on um, on the desert, um, and um, uh, yeah, two of the um, uh, aspects that I would like to address here from from um, uh, the book, and I have to actually, so I can see my notes, uh, change my glasses, um, two of the aspects that I would like to touch upon here um, uh, that I found interesting um, in, in Natalie's book um, is the specifics of empire building, and the um, um, historic location um, of exchanges in the 40s and in, uh, during the Cold War. Um, in a different context, I recently reread an essay by Henry Luz, The American Century, uh, that was first published in 1941 uh, in Life magazine. Um, and in that essay, uh, Luz actually talked about fear fear uh, of being, the fear of the United States of being drawn into, into world, world War II. It will be the end of our constitutional democracy, he, he said. Um, and he asked his, his readers, what um, are we fighting for? What would we be fighting for? And mind you, this was uh, before Pearl Harbor, a few months, nine months or so before Pearl Harbor. Uh, what would we be fighting for? Um, and um, uh, what, I, what I realized, and, and it was really emphasized in, in your book, is that when we talk about wars, um, or perhaps until recently, when we talked about wars uh, and empire, um, it was not so much about territorial gain, 
not, not so much about territory anymore as it was about values. Um, and uh, Arid Empire, the, the book that we are talking about tonight, uh, certainly makes, makes, makes a very solid point about values uh, that empire building, um, 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 the empire that, that you know the values that 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 enable empire building, so to speak. Those values lose names them democracy, freedom, uh, just uh, justice. And how can this goal be achieved? He asked. Um, it is, and I, I'm quote, I'm quoting again. It is the manifest duty of this country to feed all the people of the world who, as a result of this worldwide collapse of civilization, are hungry and destitute. Um, and it, it's exactly this, um, this context and the historical proximity between uh, Lewis's article um, and one of the, the projects that uh, Natalie um, uh, discusses in her book um, that, that I find, find really interesting. Uh, and the project that, that you discuss in, in your book, Natalie, is the uh, 1942 agricultural mission, mission to Saudi Arabia. Um, uh, a mission in which the knowledge that, um, that American agriculturalists, scientists um, uh, acquired was basically transferred uh, uh, back to, to Saudi Arabia. Again, ironically, a country that, uh, that had a culture uh, with uh, 2,000 years of experience in, in agricultural practices. Um, and they did so um, mostly um, uh, in order to, to gain strategic support um, of the Saudi king um, in uh, the, the uh, World War II efforts. So uh, a very close connection between agriculture, agricultural uh, um, uh, efforts feeding the world uh, and political um, uh, and strategic interests that, that we find there. So agricultural knowledge emerges as a tool of empire building abroad. Um, uh, it has served as um, successful, you could say, uh, within the US, uh, building the North America, building the US as a, as a continental uh, empire, and it's, it's, it now was exported, um, or used, I should say, uh, to do the same for a new kind of empire building, non-territorial, value-based, culture-based empire building uh, abroad. Uh, and of course we know that that then con continued uh, during the Cold War uh, era. So that's one aspect that I find particularly stimulating in, in the book. And the second one uh, is an aspect that um, uh, basically uh, has become uh, part of much of my, my thinking as a, as a scholar, both as a cultural studies and a literary studies scholar um, who works at the intersection between American studies and the environmental humanities. And that's questions about, um, uh, you know, concepts such as innovation, science, progress, and their, their connection with each other. Um, what are the concepts um, um, of empire building? And yes, uh, that's also something that, that the book carves out uh, and makes almost palpable um, that um, those ideas um, are certainly um, ideas that, that um, yeah, um, empires can't live without, so to speak. So um, what shall we do uh, when we praise innovation? What shall we do when we say, um, you know, listen to science. Uh, does this also mean that we support empire building? Uh, I guess um, uh, it does. And I think that that only uh, shows the ambivalence of, of the time that, uh, and the ambiguities of the time that we live in. Um, so, uh, um, questions that, 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 that are raised in the book, what are the specific entanglements of the ideology uh, on the one hand, and the practice of empire, uh, and scientific exchange uh, is something that certainly is a tool of empire building. So, um, uh, you know, always look at the subtext and the literary um, uh, scholar here um, uh, is, is talking about. And in this context, I like particularly uh, one 
um, um, uh, one term that, that you used, and that's the term informal empire. Uh, and this kind of in, in, informal empire building, invisible empire building perhaps, or inconspicuous empire building uh, is, is certainly um, um, the, the, the subject of arid empire. Thank you. Hello, everyone. So I'll begin by thanking Natalie. Uh, this is very exciting to be here. Uh, thank you, Brigitte, for setting it all up and being patient. Um, I'm also coming from literary studies, which means I don't do what I'm supposed to do when I'm supposed to do it. So thank you for the patience of everybody uh, in making sure I stay on track. So I'll go for about 10 minutes, and I'm going to spend those 10 minutes today describing some implications for literary studies that emerge from Natalie Cook's Arid Empire. There are a few, and I'll give them as a list right now. First, the importance of tracing as broadly as possible the spatial imaginary that suffuses every single desert text, and to examine these connections thoroughly while doing the work of literary interpretation. Second, and this is a very specific point, a reevaluation of 20th century Dust Bowl literature, especially given that the New Deal's Farm Security Administration uh, it makes arguments about the need to build a broad base of agricultural expertise to defeat the Dust Bowl particularly the spread of alfalfa farming. Um, it's very specific, uh, and Natalie's book actually does a great job of answering this. Third, to consider desert farming as a modernizing technology requires its social reproduction, especially in terms of how it renews imperial and capitalist ambitions through technocratic labor. That's to say, arid empire's desert agriculture expertise is a settler form, and it displaces other forms of desert knowing and inhabitation. Fourth, the selective and ever-shifting designation, there are a lot of things, uh, and I will go through them so quickly, so um, yeah. Fourth, the selective and ever-shifting designation of the desert as empty is a matter of colonial convenience. In this logic, deserts can therefore be greened, or they can be emptied. Emptiness can be converted into greenness through direct technological intervention and emptiness can be used as a perpetual tool for removing indigenous people. Essentially, you can keep reinventing emptiness, and you can keep removing people. Fifth, indigenous ways of knowing, inhabiting, moving through, and agriculturally cultivating the desert, they do continue to survive. And the poet Ophelia Cepeda, with whom Natalie finishes the book, gives us notable examples of what the indigenous writer and philosopher Joel Beisner has called survivance. And if I have time, which I know I will not have time, I'd love to talk about how uh, the term desert to desert connections offers a model for theorizing interaction and entanglement that I think might finally help us start to move beyond comparative literature as a framework. So first, literary studies is both highly specialized and notoriously and obnoxiously expansive. We do what we want with what we want, even though we say we have a direct method. This contradiction at the heart of the discipline is appropriate enough, given that the study of English language literature has firmly planted its roots in the mixed up soils of imperial expansion and colonial education and civilizational reaffirmation. That is, that Western culture and its ways of knowing are the way to be human. Thus, English literature has within it two tendencies. It's exclusivist, but it's also expansionist. So even as I'm poking fun at my beloved discipline, I'm also quite serious. We've taken concepts, especially from geography, to create an abstract idea of the so-called spatial turn in literary studies. It's good to talk about space, it's good to talk about land and what it's doing, but most often we use phenomenology, and actually I will say we misuse phenomenology in literary studies, to center the human and the experiential basis of how to feel the world or how to experience that world. What Arid Empire teaches me as a literary critic is to see connection and entanglement as fundamental to the experience and history of very specific spaces and not as abstractions and not as metaphors. Natalie observes the patterns and iterations of, quote, Arid Empire narratives that have circulated between Arizona and Arabian deserts for decades. The modernizers will come with their farming skills and they will cultivate modernity. 
This is a quite literal entanglement of agriculture and ideology. To plant things is to modernize things, or to plant them the right way is to modernize them. Point two. Arid empire and its examination of the techno-optimists, as Natalie puts it, at the heart of settler desert agriculture, should prompt literary studies to take careful account of how we have long historicized and taught the literatures of the Dust Bowl. For those of you who aren't familiar, the Dust Bowl is this really traumatic moment in US 20th century history from 1935 to 1938, when an enormous famine and drought sort of captured the American imaginary. If you've seen photography from this time period, you often see mothers or children who are starving. You often see people walking through dust storms. So it was an extreme drought in parts of Oklahoma, Texas, Kansas, Colorado, Nebraska, and New Mexico. So a canonical text like John Steinbeck's The Grapes of Wrath is directly about this. Or predecessors like Willa Cather's O Pioneers. These books are ripe for reassessment, especially because they're about agricultural techno-optimism. To plant this world, to make it green, we can truly find America's promise. That's what these texts argue. Even John Steinbeck's condemnation of cash crop dependence. He says, well, these poor farmers could only grow cotton or uh, grain, and this is why their farms failed. Even that, though the indictment is largely against the factory farms and banks that own these farms, it's undergirded by a wistful desire for innovative, soil-preserving agriculture, specifically alfalfa. This happens in even Sonora Babs' really incredible rising book. It's called uh, Whose Names Are Unknown. I'm assuming most people have not read it. It was, in fact, plagiarized by John Steinbeck um, to write The Grapes of Wrath. Well, the main uh, protagonists want to grow alfalfa and soil-preserving crops. As Natalie's book shows, the reason I'm talking about alfalfa so much, it's one of the most water-intensive and destructive crops you can possibly grow. It's great for deserts, as long as you have the water, because they need sunlight all the time. So there's this big question. Why has American agricultural techno-optimism, why have American socialists, leftists, progressives, turned to alfalfa as the solution to all our farming problems, when it turns out it's one of the most destructive crops you can grow in the desert? The third point, and I'm going to skip it, actually. I'll just skip it. Why not? It's about social reproduction, which is a very specific concept I've grown enthralled by. We'll skip it. So the fourth thing is this. Deserts are not empty. Arid Empire examines how discourses of desert emptiness are not just colonial abstractions or rhetorical flourishes to prompt settlement and land grabs. Rather, as Natalie shows, emptiness is a carefully articulated designation that can be utilized and optimized to promote Arid Empire expertise. Emptiness is a justification. It's not a prompt. Emptiness can be filled. It's a tabula rasa, that blank slate that can be written upon. It's a desert dune that can become a rolling green hill, if we just imagine it hard enough. Converting emptiness into full greenness reveals settler arid empire expertise, especially at the expense of indigenous peoples who have been farming these lands for millennia. Emptiness requires, as Natalie puts it, intervention, often made in order to correct previous failings. It's a matter, as she puts it, of finding, quote, the right inputs to be brought under cultivation and developed according to Anglo-American visions of civilization. Indeed, as she argues, settler, settler networks of science and expertise advocate for vast agricultural expansion, efficiency, finding the right profitable surplus, masking the catastrophic destruction of our waterways, the aquifers, and just the desert lands in general. They're called Xeriscapes, X-E-R-I scapes. By insisting that they are transforming the desert, they're not destroying it, they're just transforming it. Natalie continues, arguing that these networks of settler colonial science and expertise develop and expand their arid empire such that it continues to hinge on earlier ways of imagining the desert, not just as barren wasteland, but as a place in need of intervention to be tamed and to be made productive. For those of you who know the story of Southwest colonization, U.S. Empire didn't know what to do with people who already knew how to farm and farm quite well in the desert. So they had to just optimize it, technologically speaking. The assumed emptiness of deserts and of desert lands has been used and was used in the 20th century to justify atomic tests around the world. Almost every single atmospheric test took place 
in a space that was nominated a desert in one way or another, a desert or a desert island. Nevada, New Mexico, the Bikini Atoll, Christmas Island, Australia, Kazakhstan, Siberia, Algeria. And there are other ways that deserts have been declared emptied and then weaponized, of course. The US-Mexico border was turned into what Jason de Leon has called the land of open graves. Internment and concentration camps in the US West, almost all of which were overlaid on forts and schools that facilitated native disposition and genocide, began to house Japanese uh, concentration camp interns during World War II. The Syrian desert and the refusal of care afforded to the refugees there right now and for the last decade. Israel's national project of making a garden of Palestine, the fact that it's called the greening of the desert. The Armenians were forced to undertake marches through Jordan and Syria during the Ottoman liquidation of their homeland. The death camps for Herero and other peoples in Namibia that the German Empire forged. The Atacama Desert in Chile and the disappearance of pro-Allende activists and fighters. These are all deserts where people are placed because they're empty. I'm out of time, so I'm gonna end there and I'll talk about connections some other time. Thank you, Natalie. Still a bit uh, out of it for my flight, so <laughs> let's do my best. I'm Ingrid Nelson. I am based in the Department of Geography and Geosciences, newly named. We joined with the geologists uh, at the University of Vermont, also a land-grant institution. And first, I want to thank Brigitte and Alisa uh, for their hosting and helping um, to organize everything here in celebration of this um, fantastic book and all of the many years of um, Natalie's uh, scholarship and analysis. Um, I say many years because it's almost 20 years now that I've known you, um, Natalie, which is um, pretty wild. And I view this project with a smile because I see many of our ongoing conversations in the pages. Um, across many conversations as, as we were trained to be human geographers, her more political geography and me as a political ecologist, um, and wow. especially a feminist political ecologist. And so with that, um, with those many years of conversation, um, it's, it's been interesting as a process to learn as a form of unlearning um, in our various institutional contexts and, and, and um, approaches to analysis. And we both went to Dartmouth College, as was mentioned in the introduction, for our undergraduate degrees. And they have a pretty robust study abroad program. And before um, kind of inviting myself onto her study abroad program onto to the Czech Republic for my birthday weekend, um, I had done the, the Czech Republic study abroad trip uh, as well. But prior to that, I had done their Southern African study abroad um, arrangement and one of the key places that we visited was the Namib desert and we were given in that time around 2003 um, narratives of um, desert survival but very like German narratives of desert survival and histories of um, defectors from from the war effort and we were not told about the Herero death camps at all um, in that process and what that space, the Namib space, was for us in that um, visit, that journey, was actually a training for us as undergraduate students to become experts in um, addressing climate change. And we were there to be inspired by the desert ecologies of the plants that were taking fog droplets out of the air from the Atlantic and the species that could burrow into the sand dunes a meter um, deep to stay away from the hot suns. Um, and survive that and then come out at sunset and make, make their way and to sort of garner inspiration from those desert ecologies. And um, taking that forward, I, this was my first experience in a desert space, um, the Namib Desert, and it was um, really interesting to me because I had been brought up in a space of 
agricultural training that was not the desert. It was those New Englanders um, who were encouraged, following Natalie's narrative, right, to go and, and green and settle the, the Arizona um, spaces and, and the West. Um, but for me, I had grown up um, in the 4-H, which is an um, agricultural training program through Cornell Cooperative Extension to become a proper dairy farmer. Um, and so I had spent my teenage years learning industrial agricultural techniques and then hitting Dartmouth College and learning about political ecology and maybe challenging some of those claims to expertise in that process. Um, and so I've always had a fascination with what I, was tr what I had failed to do, was to become a proper dairy farmer. Um, and so the stories about um, the Saudi exploits with um, dairy cattle and um, cultivating alfalfa, they ring true for me very specifically because it's this industrial model in a terrain which is um, ecologically you know, quite different from from what I had been um, trained to do. And I now live in Vermont, which is a big dairy state, losing all of its farms to Arizona. Um, <laughs> so it's, these cycles are very interesting. The reason why I dwell on some of these, these moments of learning and unlearning and these questioning is because as a feminist political ecologist, um, we don't always study gender. We, there's a big thread in feminist political ecology looking at power relations of nature and society, kind of, and what comes through that. And the methods are really key, and feminist science studies is really important as a, as a tenet of feminist political ecology. And um, also methods. And autoethnography is something that I want to highlight in Natalie's book. And that is a very important analytical method and a very open and vulnerable space to write, write from and write through a narrative of why one calls a place home, right? And then to interweave that with a robust historical analysis and the many, many years of archival work and travels and observations, ethnographic um, efforts. So the weaving of, of that together for me makes this actually a, a kind of a feminist political ecology text because of the, the really careful autoethnographic writing and rooting of one's positionality um, in the settler colonial narrative and practice. Um, and so I find that to be, to be really important and instructive even for some of my colleagues who are still really um, hesitant to take on that kind of method of writing. And I did not bring a time um, thing, so just give me a signal when I'm done, all right. Um, <laughs> okay, and um, the other things that we tend to focus on in feminist political ecology are around um, knowledge through the body, emotion, and other kinds of relations. And Natalie's book also forces me to step back and remember that the global scale um, is really critical and can shape the kinds of labors and relations that I study every day. Um, they have huge importance. Um, some of the, the friendships, the, the geopolitical um, maneuvers that we see throughout this text, um, they're at once personal and also really like far-reaching and affecting many, many lives, right? And so to be able to hold that together in, in one analysis I think is really important. And one that, um, honestly, I don't think enough folks in my area of work in feminist political ecology, I don't think we do enough of that, is to keep, we're so busy critiquing the, the global top-down analysis and centering the body and the, and the self that we can lose sight of some of these really important um, pieces of the puzzle. So I, I really appreciate it with that, especially um, because I teach so much of your work in my classes as we're unpacking. Um, I have so many environmental studies majors um, who are very much bought into my university's land grant mission of going out and saving the world and the environment. And so that is a lot of work to be unpacking. Um, and so Natalie's work across many articles and this book um, really helps in, in doing that piece by piece. Um, and then finally, an area that sort of I've been moving into more and more as of late is, is an area called feminist digital natures. Um, and that is the, well, we have these very material and also they're at once material, they're, one, they're also an imaginary, right, of a desert space and of territory and empire. But a, a huge area of 
uh, territorial creation and conquest and narrative creation right now is in the virtual world. Um, and so I've been studying games um, more and more and the territories that are produced through procedural generation, through game designers and the kinds of ecologies and landscapes that, that come through that. And um, so one thing that Natalie's book reminds me to do all the time is to actually to pay attention to the deserts in the games that I'm studying with my students and through um, our projects to understand sort of the power relations, the, 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 the creation of a relation to, to a digital place that many, of, many, many people have. And for some people, they'll never travel into outer space, right? But they may do so through a game very well, or already have done so. Um, and so it's a, it's, it's a, it's a critical space of, of, for me at least, human geographical interpretation and analysis. And um, so some games that I've been thinking through are the popular Stardew Valley, and it's a, um, it's a homesteading game where you're tired of working for the Joja Corporation, and you kind of have a, a moment, a crisis, and you inherit this farm from a deceased grand grandfather, and you start to farm and make your way in this little town. And once you reach certain achievements, you can actually fix the bus station and take a bus ride to a desert. And it's very interesting in, the, in this game, the desert, there's a little store where you can buy trinkets and things and trade. And then if you, again, meet certain levels, you can then get into the back casino that's sort of secret. <laughs> uh, you can fish for a very limited number of species. You cannot farm in the desert, so this is interesting. This, while well, you can homestead in various environments and ecologies and landscapes in this game, you cannot farm in the desert, which I find fascinating. But the mines in this space are the source of the most valuable um, ore um, for purchasing things throughout the game, which is iridium ore, right? So it's very interesting to see how the desert works through a space like this and why it is so, um, why it's so relaxing as a, as a recreational space for so many um, who, who utilize this game. And just lastly, a couple others, um, the Spanish Greek, which is a story of a girl who loses her mother. Um, uh, her mother dies, and she's going through the stages of grief. And as she traverses and solves puzzles through the landscapes, she starts out in gray. Um, and then each stage, you add color, red, then green, then blue. And uh, her dress takes on these colors, and the landscapes grow, um, bring forth more life. And the first stage of grief is the desert. And <laughs> she's pounded by these sandstorms. And so um, as somebody who studies the body and emotion, this is really also important. The desert is, a, is an emotional space for so many people, um, as, as Natalie has, has analyzed so well. And so again, paying attention to that in my own work. And then finally, there's an interesting game, Don't Starve, which has been really well analyzed by um, Alinda Chang. Uh, who is uh, working on nature, portraying nature in video games as well. And there's different biomes in the game where you try to survive. Darkness kills you, um, really creepy monsters kill you, spiders and many various things. And you have a sense of your sanity. You can lose sanity, you can get hungry, and you can be injured um, by the things that will kill you. But they forgot water. Um, and so there, it's interesting that the biomes that narrate progress or survival, um, they're all there except for deserts. There's some barren rock spaces, but there's no deserts because water is not a feature that you're trying to monitor to survive for some reason in a game called Don't Starve. So <laughs> it's very bizarre. So um, while deserts are not usually the focus of my analysis, um, one thing that I can take away um, from reading this, this really excellent analysis and just from knowing Natalie for so many years is to really pay attention um, to the um, potential of these spaces to help us question um, why we love being in these spaces um, so much. And they're, the fun thing about games is that they're, they mess up. Like there's these, these moments when um, you can find these um, decolonial potentials or play spaces of play where you can challenge more dominant narratives. And so that's something that um, my students and I are seeking together to look at where the glitches, if you will, in the games um, and what that can potentially open up. Um, but there's also just a lot of reinforcement of colonial tropes, let's be honest. <laughs> Thank you.
Hello, everyone. Um, so I'm Brittany Mache. I'm an assistant professor of environmental studies at Williams College. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'm actually really excited that I'm following Ingrid because several of the things that you talked about are things that I wanted to draw from the book. Um, but first, thank you to Natalie for this generous invitation for writing an excellent book. Thank you to Brigitte for the logistical help. Thank you to Elisa, who I think I saw, for helping me navigate the bus system. It really is a pleasure to be here. Um, so there are kind of three aspects of my life, my work, that I um, really am appreciative to Natalie and this book for helping me think through. So those three areas are family, teaching and my own scholarship. So I'll take each in turn. So like Natalie, I have family connections to the US Southwest and it has shaped my lifetime love of deserts. So I was born in Texas, my father was born in Texas, my grandparents and more recently my mother live in New Mexico and Kirtland Air Force Base in Albuquerque, New Mexico was my grandfather's last military post. My mother has decided to retire there as well after serving 20 years in the US Air Force and working for 15 years at the Pentagon. So while I don't have the same image of Natalie of playing cowgirl as a child, there is a way that my enamorment with the desert is also suffused with this understanding of the desert as a military space, right? a place where my military family settled and lived. And of these kind of family connections, I was struck by a phrase from Natalie's book. So this is from US diplomat, I think it's Parker T. Hart. So Americans of desert upbringing, right? And so how both Natalie, but also myself, think of ourselves as Americans of desert upbringing. And the ways that our family connections shape how we actually are taught to take ownership of spaces. So Natalie made reference to the ways that she was taught to see Arizona as hers. In so many ways, I think of New Mexico as mine, right? The place of my childhood, the place of my family, the place I go to celebrate holidays. But the book demands that we rethink our childhood stories in relation to the Southwest, a demand that was deeply moving to me, especially for its vulnerability, which Ingrid talked about. I was also struck by the way that Natalie made me reflect on how the inheritances of our family lineage and our existing imperial citizenship then continue to trace through our research trajectories, right? So I appreciated Natalie's moment where she describes this encounter with George Babcock Cressy and the Syracuse archive. And I myself have had these moments of eerie deja vu where you are encountering ostensibly a research subject who reminds you so much of yourself, right? But then also in that reminder destabilizes what you think that you are doing as a researcher. I think as geographers, we are, as critical geographers, we think that we are critically interrogating the worlds that we inhabit. And yet when you encounter these colonial officials who have similar backgrounds or who, who look like you and the, the roots that you are taking, it really makes you pause and sort of ask yourself, well, what does it mean to be a contemporary geographer studying some of these questions? Um, and so in, in relation to this kind of family aspect, I find Natalie's book manages the impressive feat of being deeply personal, but without navel gazing, right? Without this kind of descent into centering oneself in the story in a way that's actually detrimental to the, the, um, the scholarship that you're, you're trying to advance. But it's also deeply empirical without being condescendingly didactic, right? There's a way that the empirics really invite the reader in, in a way that keeps you turning the page. Um, so now turning to teaching. So I, t I also teach um, within the field of environmental studies and I have students who want to be environmentalists, who want to save nature, whatever that means for them. Um, but it also means that they have an idealized notion of the environment writ large. Many of my students, most of my students are US citizens. Williams College is an elite private school in the middle of the woods. So many of my students come from well-to-do backgrounds and they have all of these narratives of these family trips to these iconic sites throughout the United States, the national parks, other sites of US environmental governance. 
And Natalie's book, which I can't wait to teach, um, offers a key contribution to rethinking the histories of the territory that we now call the United States. So I'm actually in the process of developing a new course at Williams, tentatively called Deserts Between Utopia and Dystopia. I think Natalie has just given all of us new courses to teach, um, which is really exciting. Um, but I hope that, th that the book, um, which will figure prominently in that class, will invite students to reflect on deserts in new ways. Um, but I also think there's a way that contemporary environmentalism, and especially as espoused by my students, has these kind of iconic sites that are worthy of saving. So oftentimes my students will think about saving the rainforest, saving the glaciers, saving oceans, right? And so I, I wonder if there's a way without kind of reinforcing colonial idealization of deserts, there's a way that we can also center deserts in a way that feels like a more progressive attempt to reckon with deserts on their own merit, right? So how does the book also invite us to do that, especially towards the end? And then finally, in teaching, um, I'm also affiliated in science and technology studies at Williams, and I deeply appreciate the way that the book interrogates the role of science in forging and maintaining U.S. empire. And the moment in the book which talks about officials at the University of Arizona taking advantage specifically of Cold War investments in scientific research to, in Natalie's words, position desert knowledge as a weapon in the anti-communist fight is something that I found really attractive and I think would actually concretize some of the concepts around science and power that in some of the normative texts of science and technology studies, students kind of get in the weeds about, right? And so they say, well, well are you telling us that like science, science is wrong and bad and we shouldn't do science, right? There's a way that Natalie's book is able to give empirical detail, details that show the kind of ambiguities and the contestations over science without kind of throwing the baby out with the bathwater. And then finally, in my own scholarship, so Natalie's previous work has already been incredibly influential for me as a scholar. Her work helped me think through an article that I recently published in the Journal of Environment and Society, so thinking specifically about the racial politics of deserts. And like Natalie, I'm trained as a geographer, and surprisingly, there aren't many human geographers working on deserts. I, it, it seems like such a massive oversight, and yet there aren't many of us. So being a part of what feels like a, an undervalued field within geography is really exciting. Um, and her work in this book provides an excellent model for how to do historical work, and I have to phrase this um, politely because there's some actual historians in the room, uh, how to do historical work that is still informed by geographical questions, right? So questions about the production of imperial space, about the invisible infrastructures working across different locales, um, but also about how to denaturalize the um, seemingly self-evidently natural. Um, so again, all of this is really exciting for me as I'm, I'm working on finishing my first book, which I was able to talk a little bit about with some students, I guess that was two days ago, I'm still jet lag. Um, but my first book, which is Sustainable Empire, Nature, Knowledge, and Insecurity in the Sahel. Um, but reading Natalie's book also gave me the confidence to start to see glimmers of my second book, which I have tentatively titled Desert Black, Arid Lands and Imperial Democracy in the Transatlantic World. And it's, it's based on a recently published article, an article, again, that Natalie's work helped me um, think through. Um, so as I start to close, I, I think I want to leave us with something that I actually said to one of um, our colleagues here, Jamie, as we were walking along the lovely Necker River, which is that one of the best parts of this job is being in community and conversation with people that you admire, people who are doing work that you find innovative and exciting, but also that remind you what a privilege it is to write for a living, to think for a living. So I, I really thank Natalie for, for doing that for me and just congratulations on an excellent book. Hello everyone. Um, my name's Christian Henderson and I am uh, at Leiden University where I teach uh, uh, political economy, uh, political ecology, and uh, Middle Eastern studies. 
Um, uh, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. Uh, this is one of the most well-organized uh, academic events I've attended recently. Uh, there was a full plan uh, of action that was sent to me, and uh, I, was, I was quite impressed with that. I was met at the station by, uh, by Carol. There's Carol there, hi. Um, which, was, uh, which was a real pleasure. Uh, so my work focuses on the Gulf, and it focuses on food in the Gulf. And uh, I'm currently or just about to finish a, a manuscript on uh, food and agriculture in the Gulf states. So it's really, easy, uh, really uh, interesting to read uh, your book, uh, because it felt in a way like a form of companionship in some ways, in the sense that uh, I look, uh, we, at some, in some points we both used uh, the same sources, um, but we came close, uh, but we also kind of came up with different uh, conclusions and interpretations. And then, of course, uh, as we were doing this together, you suddenly uh, disappeared completely and went off to Arizona, which is completely out of my... Uh, uh, my Ken completely. Uh, I also teach a, a course on political ecology uh, of the Middle East, and uh, your work on deserts uh, is inspired a week uh, on that course called uh, Desert Dreams, and uh, this, this book will be a great addition to that course. Um, so in my own research on agriculture uh, in the Gulf, I came across a book written by an American woman uh, who spent several years in Saudi Arabia uh, with her husband in the 1980s. Uh, her husband was working on a uh, large agribusiness grain farm in uh, central Saudi Arabia, and she describes her experiences of living on this farm. And one of the things she mentions is that when they first arrived on this project, um, they could not begin work on this site because it was occupied by a group of Palestinians who were farming this land in a way that seemed to be informal. They didn't have any uh, uh, formal land rights, um, but nonetheless, they had been farming this land for several years. Um, the Palestinians refused to leave for obvious reasons. They had been working the land. Uh, they didn't want to uh, abandon the labor that they had invested in this place. Um, and after several failed mediations, her husband finally decided to resolve the matter by force. And according to the author, he used a tractor and plow to destroy the crops that the Palestinian farmers had been working on and thereby forcing them to leave. <clears throat> uh, and the author remarked, and I quote, Terry, her husband, felt a little like an American pioneer cultivating the land of American Indians. Now, as I read this, I was struck by the irony of this remark. Um, here was a well-paid American farmer, uh, himself of settler lineage, dispossessing these Palestinians, themselves victims of another form of settler colonialism, to enclose the land and its water on behalf of its owners, who just so happened to be members of the Saudi royal family. <clears throat> so my work has a sole focus, really, on the Gulf states and Middle East. So when I read the description of Terry's wife, I did not really think that much more of it. Uh, other than the fact that it was really a reflection of the author's crass lack of self-awareness and uh, kind of lack of irony, really. <clears throat> However, Natalie's book illustrated to me that the comments that she made were really underpinned by a far deeper uh, history of material institutional ties and uh, uh, colonial attitudes to land and, and people that I'd really not considered. Uh, so the book applies a methodology that examines two places, uh, the desert areas of the US uh, and, and Arabia. And the work describes how two separate places are adjoined by an imperial imagination. And uh, this is quite a novel uh, methodology that involves what you describe as uh, the ability to see double. Um, a methodological means to see across time and space uh, and to be double two, I'm quoting you, to keep that multiplicity and tension in focus without uh, trying to clear the way for a singular vision. Uh, so this is an ambitious uh, a framework, uh, but in, in applying it, I think the book really shows how the technopolitics of the US colonial project uh, in its own desert spaces also resh reshaped the ecological governance of Arabia. Um, which I found very interesting from the perspective of my own work, because 
I ne hadn't necessarily full and fully taken into account just how uh, deep uh, and material that process was. Um, one of the ways that this kind of, your book made sense to me was that uh, during the course of my research, I had looked at a large number, in, in the 1980s in Saudi Arabia and also in the 1970s, the government was rich with oil and one of the things that they did with this money was that they sent Saudi students to study uh, in US universities uh, with grants and a large number of them went to the University of Arizona. Uh, and I kept noticing this in the, uh, uh, these PhD uh, dissertations, but I, again, I hadn't really considered the reasons why or what, what that meant, but your book uh, explained that to me. Um, so the book is a, really a, a welcome and needed intervention into the study of human geography and political ecology in the Middle East. Um, for those of you less familiar with the region, there is a, a really remarkable dearth of studies, I think, uh, in the Anglophone literature uh, that apply these frameworks. Um, and I think Natalie's work is a big contribution to this, to this a small but growing field that does actually take those questions seriously. Uh, Gulf studies is also quite a parochial and conservative field. Uh, and Natalie's book takes a sledgehammer to that. Uh, and that's a, something that I really approve of uh, and I think is uh, long overdue. Um, I also thought the book challenges the axiomatic way in which arid landscapes are understood in the region. So the political ecology of Arabia is partly an outcome of imperial history, yet at the same time this should be understood in a way that avoids determinism and exceptionalism and by emphasizing the interaction between these two spaces, I think you offer one way of dealing with that. Uh, as m other people have pointed out, the book is really adept in the way that it deals with questions of positionality. Uh, and uh, uh, the, you know, the tone is frank and explicit, um, but it does not drift into a kind of heavy-handed mea culpa, and I, I appreciated this. Uh, it shows a way of addressing one's own personal history as a child of empire and the violence and problems that it embodies, yet at the same time it expresses a confidence in the ability to conduct research that serves as a break to the past. As a British citizen who has own a similar, or some, in some ways uh, not unsimilar uh, a relationship with the subject in the sense I have family members who served in the military in the region, uh, I found this uh, 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 inspiring and helpful. Um, and it's not necessarily an easy thing to do either to talk about this in public. Uh, so I, 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 I kind of respected that. Um, I also thought the book was beautifully written um, and very clear, uh, which is quite a rare commodity sometimes, unfortunately. Um, and it's a standard that I think um, I, will, I, I will certainly try and uh, emulate. Um, if we have time for questions, I would like to know a little bit more about why you chose and delineated Arabia for this framework. One question I had really was that, well, the violence of the settler colonial project in the US is obvious. Um, but one could argue that within the Gulf states, the US empire has taken on a more relatively benign form. Uh, I think the word informal empire was used by one of the speakers. Um, but especially when we compare this experience to other states in the region, such as Palestine, Iraq, or Yemen, uh, uh, places where um, US empire, one could argue, had a far more violent uh, manifestation. So if we expanded this framework to other Arab spaces in the region, what might this say about the form of US empire and its geographic imaginaries? Um, and I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. I hope you have a little bit of uh, attention left. So I'm extremely pleased to be here. Thank you, Natalie, for the invitation and for the chance also to, to have a few words on, on your amazing book here. I'm, first of all, extremely pleased to see Natalie in Germany. I'm absolutely thrilled she took on the position. And to see you in, um, in German geography is, uh, is, uh, is truly exciting to... Um, yeah, to truly internationalize our institutional landscape of geography. So I'm a human geographer from the University of Mainz, just 
up the, uh, the country a little bit. Um, well, I, um, I come in, I, I haven't, uh, we haven't um, met long before uh, today and a uh, common friend and colleague from the University of Singapore, where I've been working for a couple of years, she brought us in contact with the words, I don't know whether you remember, you're both geographers, you're both critical geographers, you're working on the Gulf, you're both keen road cyclists all over the world, <laughs> you should meet if you haven't yet. So um, thanks for this very thought-provoking, amazing oeuvre, and I love the rhetoric, I can just follow my... Um, um, uh, Christian, who, who just said it before, beautifully written, and it is bridging so many aspects that haven't been brought together yet uh, in this way, as far as I'm um, well informed. So I, we don't have the title here yet any longer, but um, you know, so this title, Arid Empire, for a geographer, really grounded here. Yeah, this is first of all a very uh, a notable yet intriguing oxymoron. Yeah, arid landscapes as geographical units. They're usually defined by a scarcity of resources as challenging habits, habitats, densely populated, some kind of empty territory as we have often um, heard yet. So who would want to dominate or control such territory? Um, empire stands for the opposite, a prosperous, powerful formation implicating a strong control over different resources, human capital, territory, material resources. So thus, the title of Natalie's book is truly arousing curiosity. Is it an ancient, dried up empire that lost its supposedly former glory, who is not instantly caught, I uh, enjoyed the, the makeup of this book, uh, by the font size of the title, Arid Empire, um, has already read the small subtitle, which is above placed, um, indicating what empire we are going to read about. So a rather mystical or metaphorical empire that is built upon networks, connections, maybe tangible, maybe not, two regions far apart on this planet, but interwoven somehow um, by something that goes back to geographicalness of being arid. So I'm not bothering or boring you with traditional geography here, but it used to engage in the fields of area studies, regional geography, and um, this enthusiasm about, um, about this descriptive idea of writing about the earth started fading away over the course of the second half of the 20th century. So space and place became very differentiated signifiers. Absolute relational space turned into a common understanding of spatialities, spaces constructed and produced by social practices, narratives, stories, all underlaid by the subtle power asymmetries or discursive hegemonies and real geopolitics. So Natalie really mastered to overcome also this territorial trap of comparative studies, framing a physical geographical unit, the desert, newly as a place and a story that has significant political strength in her words. So the truly geographical benefit of this book, I would like to emphasize in my opinion, of course, against this backdrop, what I just said, the book opens an incredibly enriching, entangled analysis of the construction of the Arabian Peninsula as a region, as an empire that has not been done in this form before. This book is an incredible kaleidoscope of different perspectives on political strategies and power, visions of leaders, economic endeavors, futuristic techno-fantasies, historical pathways crossing and interwaving in their very own dynamics over time, driven by individuals, discoverers, but also by major companies or by political leaders. So this, um, we have a, 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 yeah, a wide spectrum, multiple research uh, projects have been looking at the region of the GCC, the Gulf Cooperation Council countries from a very political geographical side mainly focusing on resources, on the rentier states, system, or at international relations. Urban geographers and planners, political and economic geographers looked at the different shades in this region. Um, I would also like to remember one former colleague who um, passed away in 2013 already, um, Heiko Schmidt, at the age of 41. He was, um, he was um, working 
on Dubai and LA at, uh, um, at themed urbanism, Dubai framed as economy of fascination. So it just rang a bell when you started with respectable sustainability. So this book of Natalie is shedding light on Arabia in a very new and interdisciplinary format to me, bringing history back into geography as key to understand current connections, which is sadly often left out in recent research. So we are living in a current time of a loud and hugely politized climate of crisis, of wars for energy resources. It's no longer wars for territory, it's the war for energy resources. And these entangled fates of Arizona and Arabia and the making of their empires based on the uh, blunt capitalization of nature, as we have heard before, and aiming for those real utopias for humankind became more politically significant than ever before. In my own research as a human geographer, which I would just uh, on a side note mention, as we were also asked to open new strands or perspectives for connecting research, I'm focusing also on entanglements of the Arabian Peninsula yet towards another compass direction towards southeast. I'm working on the migration regime over the Indian Ocean, uh, connecting Southeast Asia and the GCC due to flow flows of labor, human capital remittances. Furthermore, I'm also working on the process of nation building in the GCC, including resource nationalism and the current ongoing transformations, and also the aspirations of the civil societies, or if you want to call them like that, of the uh, domestic resident societies in the Gulf states. Um, I've been working and studying basically in the Sultanate of Oman, south of Dubai, and its neighboring countries uh, since 2009. And there are many shades of empire that could also be pointed out. Most importantly, though, my research areas learned me to apply a relational perspective, which is inevitably um, with all those critically um, aspects regarded um, due to the connectivity. So leading to ethnographical methods, like following the things or the people uh, living translocal lives is truly important to understand the cosmopolitan spirit of the Arab Gulf countries and societies. So the Arab Gulf, the Arabian Gulf country societies are made for a change for perspectives. Um, I moved to Singapore after I had an appointment in Muscat at the university at the German University of Muscat for a few years uh, to join the Middle East Institute at the National University of Singapore. This is a think tank which is proud to be an area study institute in Southeast Asia, which is unusual. And they were, in these three years while I was there, strategically turning the focus, uh, which has been significant to exchanging academic stuff as well, towards the connections between West Asia and Southeast Asia and the US. So thinking these connectivities to get ready for the major geopolitical shift we are seeing at the moment in this world, I think this book also offers an incredible um, floor and perspective to see and to, to think this world no longer in individual regions, but obviously as we know, but uh, seldomly it is pointed out that clearly um, in connectivity and in entangles entanglements, which are most of the time invisible. So um, Natalie's book for this current shift in the field of Gulf studies is really offering a fantastic compass to navigate through the principles in studying such transregional entanglements and the reciprocity in building up empires or dominant regimes over time and space. Um, there's another point of, of connection, critical resource geography is on the rise at the moment, uh, mainly focusing on post-colonial states. So there are few contributions in this field on the negotiation and extraction of fossil resources and the contestation of sustainability in the Gulf. I, I, I guess for a very significant reason. So this Gulf empire does not um, 
sorry to say, need a spokesperson yeah, of critical post-colonial studies. Again, it is Natalie who is looking also at the spectacular sustainabilities, this resource nationalism, and reflecting on a critical revision of former as you said, extractivist knowledge economy in your book that has been driving geographers in the beginning of the 20th century setting off to discover desert landscapes. Uh, to sum it up somehow, this fascination of this book is unfolding through the confluence of multiple approaches to me to understand a region like the desert in Arabia and Arizona where I have never been. <laughs> in three aspects, in their materiality, like resources, territory, culture, and heritage, through the stories, political and interests, uh, politics and interests of many different actors, from leaders to technocrats to farmers and scientists, and third, over the change of time. So this book to me is empirically, truly grounded and a critical engaged analysis of a much more than regional political geography geographers like the more than at the moment very much, <laughs> yeah. So um, the GCC is, as I said, not representing in its brutal way a post-colonial set of states. However, what is revealed with the uncovering of entangled fates here of Arabia and Arizona is the importance of time. Time and to rewind the process of colonialization, what Natalie does in her book for both regions, including her own self-reflection, which we have heard. So, Imperialism is grasped here beyond political and military influence of the US in the Gulf. She's going beyond the narrow perspective, taking further neo-colonial and imperial aspects into account, such as agriculture, science and arid land expertise, techno futures, etc. In this reciprocity as a joint project of two regimes of imperialism that build one another. As an outlook for research connections, I would love to go ahead also and to connect this oeuvre from Natalie towards some aspects which I think are hugely important at the time. Um, uh, Catherine, you mentioned the values here. Yeah? So moral geographies, um, aspects of responsibility, which I'm currently working on. Who, who who's carrying the responsibility for the fossil politics at the moment and the extraction and the change and this all those narratives against the background of, of uh, resource nationalism, which is extremely contradictory. So what I uh, call as geoethics in combination with geological resources uh, could be a fantastic combination to bring together those ideas in uh, connection with what uh, geoethics or moral geographies could do to investigate into um, this hidden power structures of the discourses over responsibility. There's plenty more to say. I see slightly fatigued faces, so I shorten my, my, my um, input here, and I would like to uh, conclude that um, the shown entanglements in the area of knowledge production and institutionalization Desert agriculture has been mentioned, but also visible at the educational landscape. If you think about geosciences, geologists are just having such a strong foothold in the GCC countries. Uh, university landscape, for good reason, extracting and being close to controlling the resources as well. Remind us truly to reflect our role as scientists as well and our responsibility to society while addressing those aspects of power structure. So I guess there is plenty to do with regard to research on distributive and structural inequalities as well, on intergenerational justice when we think about resources and equal living chances. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Natalie, for inviting me to comment on, on your new book. As a historian, I should say also a great piece of historical writing, so I also have that. <laughs> um, I'll try to keep my comments brief since we're nearing the end and uh, we're starting to be tired, I think. Um, so I will only make um, four uh, reflections. 
uh, one uh, based on one that reiterates how important I think autoethnography is in your book, and uh, three on, um, on on what I think are some of the most interesting uh, themes in the book itself. Uh, each uh, sort of based and drawing on what are my main fields of expertise as a historian, the history of development, the history uh, of the environment, environmental history, and the history of science and technology. So much has been said already on, on, on your autoethnographic approach. I'll try not to repeat too much. But uh, again, I was struck by um, how well uh, Arid Empire um, mobilizes uh, the author's uh, personal experience to introduce the argument of, of the book, but also to act as a sort of a fil rouge uh, throughout the chapters to bind them together. Uh, it really made me think deeper about how I could mobilize uh, my, per my background, my personal experience for the same purpose in, in, my, in my case study. Uh, so, and, and I'm saying this because historians um, are not really used to say the least to do autoethnography, uh, at least not in Europe especially, I would say. Uh, but also in history, it makes, um, it makes a lot of sense to ask oneself, why have we decided to study what we study? Um, how did we get there? And how can I make this personal trajectory an entry point to illuminate uh, otherwise maybe hardly visible aspects of my work? So history at its best and historical writing at its best for that matter, as in the case of your book, uh, is when one tries to delve deeper into questions that shape our identity as both scholars and, and individuals. So in this sense, the book is also an invitation to reflect on our own positionality when we think historically. And I think it represents also a wonderful instance of a way out of what I will be call, or what I will call the sort of paradox of privilege that is so common in settler societies or societies with a history of settlement and colonization such as that of Arizona. That is, um, the book is an example of how to develop a deep awareness of the violent past and privilege embedded in one's own collective history and still be able to move beyond the sort of the analytical impasse that that would imply, inhabit the violent past of imperialism and in order to make it fully visible. So moving then from autoethnography to the contents of the book, uh, we could define arid empire as it has been done already, um, essentially as a history of parallels, analogies and transfers. And um, reading this book uh, from the viewpoint of the historiography of development, I think one of the most interesting aspects is how the knowledge and practices of development and imperialism at the domestic level in Arizona then are mobilized uh, to serve the needs of development and imperialism abroad in the, in the Arabian Peninsula in your case. I think the, the history of US international development offers uh, many, many examples in this sense which only recently uh, have started to come into focus by, by historiography. Uh, there's been an article published a few years ago, for example, on um, Southwestern Native American communities in Arizona and New Mexico, uh, and how they were used as field laboratories for uh, transnational development training and also for US experts of point for technical assistance to familiarize themselves uh, with dealing with underdeveloped uh, people that they would then encounter abroad. And from my own research, um, Oklahoma State University staff, for example, uh, that led agrarian development in uh, post-World War II Ethiopia, uh, were also um, uh, sent there on account of their supposed familiarity with Native, Amer Native, Native Americans in Oklahoma. And frequent parallels and comparisons were made between the culture of Native Americans there and the culture of Ethiopians in, in, in Ethiopia. Um, but then as the book shows, this, this transfer does not only go one way. Development laboratories abroad, uh, dynamics of foreign imperialism can come back to affect domestic development uh, as, as shown in the case of the Almarai land, land investments in, in Arizona, for example. So it's very much a circular dynamics in many cases. So from the perspective of the history of development and modernization, uh, this circularity, this transfer of knowledge needs to be emphasized, I think, because it helps to see the connections, the, to blur the boundaries between metropole and colony, for example, between the global north and the global south, 
and to bring closer spaces that we often assumed as distant, as characterized by essentially different uh, structures of governmentality. Um, then, as Arid Empire, as the book shows, and, and I come here to my third reflection, one ideal entry point to observe all these parallels, all these transfers and connections are deserts, of course. And thinking about deserts from the point of view of environmental history. So deserts are deserts, right? Irrespective of where they are in a political map. Their unique environmental features sort of set them apart from what Western societies historically have considered to be a normal natural environment like say New England or Germany. Uh, in this sense, Arid Empire offers us a window to inquire about the environmental otherness, we might say, of deserts, and now this otherness was constructed and problematized by Western science. To the Western mind, if we want to generalize, the otherness of deserts is problematic. It creates a set of anxieties because it's deeply unfamiliar, right? And in, in a way, we could summarize all the various attempts uh, described in the book to modernize the desert as a fight against it, as an attempt to deny the desert and transform it into something else. Uh, after all, what do all the tropes uh, and slogans described in the book uh, mean, like, for example, making the desert bloom or transforming the wasteland into a paradise, if not a will to homogenize the deserts uh, toward, towards a more typical European environment, if not an attempt to make it more familiar to the Western eye. So in this sense, the book, in a way, can also be viewed as a history of various attempts at triumphing over the climate of the desert. Um, let's say, for example, what is irrigation or desalinization, if not an attempt to transcend water scarcity, which is the most defining feature of deserts. So, um, in this view, Arid Empire can be viewed, uh, other than as a history of our US science and expertise applied to desert, en to desert environments, also as a history um, of how it acted against them. It's a, it can also be viewed as a history of an anti-Arid Empire. Um, and this brings me to my fourth and, and last reflection uh, that has to do more with the nature and function of uh, desert expertise. So in, in Arid Empire, we are offered a fantastic description of a desert expertise that could be summarized maybe in, in, two, um, in with two terms. One is the, th the idea of techno-optimism and then the, the idea of high modernism, right? This particular configuration entails um, a series of questions uh, about how Western desert expertise relates to other forms of knowing the desert, for example, indigenous knowledge, uh, and how it relates with state political ideologies and, and imperialism. So with respect to both of these points, it seems to me that um, desert expertise has several points in common with how James Scott in Seen Like a State describes expertise itself. Uh, indigenous traditional way of, ways of knowing and acting upon the desert are neglected at best or actively obscured at worst. Uh, scientific desert expertise and modern technology are then mobilized to serve the needs of the U.S. state, state imperial vision. Um, I, I, will from, I will conclude maybe with a series of questions that can help us, like, if we have the time, then reflect further on the themes of the book and how they relate to other historical case studies. And in fact, I wonder to what extent these two features of desert expertise emerging from arid empire are specific to the context and actors of Arizona and, and, and the Arabia Peninsula, or could be generalized to define desert expertise historically and spatially. And I wonder, um, beyond the experts that you describe in Arid Empire, I wonder, for example, if any um, desert experts ever showed, instead of a techno-optimism, maybe a techno-realism vis-a-vis uh, desert environments. Uh, that is to say like a place-based or locally adapted perspective on technology transfer uh, or the relativization of the uncontested superiority of Western technology. 
And I also wonder if the history or of desert laboratories is a history of systematic erasure of indigenous knowledge and practices, or can it also be a history of encounters, a middle ground between modern science and other ways of knowing? And finally, are there um, uh, instances of desert scientific expertise going out of its role as merely a vector of political imperial ideologies and offering maybe counter narratives to acquired dogmas of agrarian modernization and maybe, who knows, alternative visions of desert futures. These are my questions, but let's congratulate you again on a fantastic uh, book, uh, Arid Empire. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for uh, staying for all of this time. Uh, we should be having some food arrive at, at some point, is that correct? Okay, uh, so we, we, we do have uh, some food coming that, that people are welcome to stay and have conversation, but I also feel I would be remiss if I didn't give the audience a chance to ask any, any questions. So maybe um, if we can, if, if, if we have time and, and people are willing to have um, five ten minutes of, of questions, which you're welcome to ask me or any of the any of the panelists here as well. So, if, if there are questions. We've, we've stunned you all into silence. <laughs> Hey, hello? Mm -hmm. Yes? Yes. Okay. Um, hello. Um, first of all, I mean, I haven't had the pleasure of reading the book, but from what others have said, I mean, it must be marvelous, so I can't wait to hold it. Um, my question is more related to the present, and it might be a bit pedestrian, but, but it is something that I've wondered recently. There's right now the crisis of the Colorado River, right? Mm. So the U.S. Um, federal government has forced the states, and apparently the states didn't come to any agreement, and two of the states that are at most um, uh, lockerheads is, are California and Arizona, mm -hmm. right? The question is, what are the options that Arizona has, mm -hmm. ha has right now? Because apparently California is looking to desalinize, right? Mm -hmm. It has the C-1A, mm -hmm. but Arizona is quite landlocked in mm -hmm. that way. Mm -hmm. So is there a, a techno-futurist positive view of, well, we'll make it rain somehow, or is there a reckoning with with their, their condition, their, their environment? Yeah. Th thank you. It's really a wonderful question and, and, and also something I've been thinking a about quite a lot and talking with the U.S. media about quite a lot after writing a, a New York Times opinion piece about these water issues that was that came out in December. Uh, so these issues were also a key part of the U.S., uh, with the, the Arizona elections in 2022. So a key piece of that was the the Arizona reaction to the Saudi dairy farm, Amarai, a Saudi-owned company has a dairy farm, alfalfa farm, actually, uh, in, in Arizona, which is then sending the alfalfa back to Saudi Arabia um, for, for the cows there. So this became a really, really big political issue this past summer in this latest round of, of elections. And as it turns out, two Democratic candidates won, uh, the Attorney General and the Governor, the new Democratic uh, Governor and, and Attorney General in Arizona, they campaigned on this water issue. So they now have uh, very aggressive ideas about trying to transform Arizona's groundwater laws and a bunch of other water laws in the state in reaction to that uh, presence of the Saudi farm. I worry, and what I sort of say in that, that New York Times piece is that they're, they're not usually, they're, they're not really thinking that much beyond that. It's kind of the, the, what, what you see, and this, this farm actually was the provocation for me to really start this project. 
um, is, is that it just becomes a really easy, convenient thing to point to uh, to the Saudi farm. Let's kick out the Saudis, end of story. But as you suggest with your question, there aren't that many options. Um, and the, the real fact of the, of the matter is that Arizona, so 78 to 80% of, of the water that the state has is going to agriculture. The agriculture economy is, is a really important part of the state, uh, but more than anything, it's, it's a really important part of the political lobby within Arizona. Uh, so I think there's, there's possibilities that if you get some political change and you can try to transform some of those uh, investments in completely unquestionably unsustainable agriculture policies in the state, then you might have a change. The concern, though, is that you, you mentioned desalination, and, and I think that the irony of, of all of this is that just as the Doug Ducey administration, so the former governor of Arizona, just left office at the end of December, the Arizona um, State Water Finance Board was being asked to, just as he was leaving, agree to a deal for an Israeli desalination company to build a desalination plant in Rocky Point, Mexico, which is exactly where, in the book, I tell a story of the first University of Arizona Environmental Research Laboratory setting up a desalination facility in Mexico there in, in, in around the early 1960s. It was it was a failure on many levels, <laughs> but what they figured out, and at that time in the 60s and 70s, energy costs were simply too high to justify desalination. They were eventually able to sell that technology and, and market that in the Middle East, especially in uh, the UAE, but also Kuwait and a number of other places. They're essentially, I mean, this is a simplification, but they're sitting on free oil and free gas to run these desalination plants. Arizona isn't, Mexico isn't, California isn't. Um, and even back in the 1960s when the University of Arizona first started that desal plant in Mexico, um, they were promising to use solar power. I've been working on this topic for the last 10 years in the Arabian Peninsula and they're not running any of these plants on solar power anytime soon, I'm sorry to say. Um, so there, there's this great promise that you would have this techno future and this is what the Israeli desal company is interested in selling to Arizona. So the deal that they set up with the outgoing Ducey administration was that Arizona should just promise to buy the water from this plant. They'll build it, $5.5 billion, 300 thousand tons of CO2 every year from this thing, um, and this will get sent to Arizona. So even in the Gulf countries, you cannot have commercial agriculture watered by desalinated water. It's still not efficient, even where the energy cost is extremely low. Now imagine the situation in California, Mexico, Arizona the energy costs <laughs> are unrealistic. If you can't even do this practically in the Arabian Peninsula, it's not going to work um, in the US Southwest. But as you can see in a lot of the stories that I tell in the book, um, that it's, it's the promise of that kind of techno, yeah, utopian project or vision uh, that that is the selling point. It doesn't matter that it's unsustainable or it's unrealistic or that if, if that Israeli plant goes forward, it would really only supply 4% of any of Arizona's water use. But we can still buy that and purchase that water from the company at an undisclosed rate. Um, and that's, that's what the administ outgoing administration has left the new governor of Arizona. So thank you, thank you again. <laughs> <As you can. laughs> okay. Well then I think we should all, oh, there, there is one question, good. Hi, thank you for the wonderful presentation. I actually have a question that I think is very stupid in scope but I'm very surprised for the title of your book, of Arid Empire, and I wanted to know if you could shed some light on the meaning of Arid in this context. I've been listening a lot of desert here, mm -hmm. and it's also to me during the entire talks, the question came to my mind, what do you define as a desert in this case? Yeah, thank thank you for the question, and and I think this is um, one of the one of the tricky pieces for me and for starting this project was that 
I actually had, had originally conceptualized this as bridging my previous work in Central Asia. So I used to work in, in Kazakhstan mostly, uh, and, and I had thought about all the, these possibilities of thinking about parallels between different deserts. And then I, I actually started to understand that they were connected places. Uh, and, and that was what sort of took, took, my, took my attention in the direction of the book. Um, but I realized in that original conceptualization of comparing deserts as such, rather than focusing on their connections, is that I was, I, I was bound to come up with some kind of essential, simplistic definition of what a desert was. And what this story tells, and I think there is still a story of connectedness between the US Southwest and Central Asia, especially related to the uh, Semipalatinsk test site and the Semipalatinsk Nevada opposition group. So together, the, the, in, the, the indigenous people of, of Nevada coming together with the Kazakhs opposing Soviet uh, nuclear weapons testing. So there's a lot there. But what you see in, in a pro, like a, a, a a connection like that, Nevada Semipalatinsk, or the, the connection uh, that, that all the sort of technocrats that I follow in this book, is that the actual physical geography and the, the, the physical features don't really matter that much. Everybody is kind of, as I said at the beginning, colonizing the desert as a word and making sense of it in that way. So you talk to plenty of people in, in, in both places, in, in the Arabian Peninsula or in Arizona, and they will all tell you all the ways that they're different. Um, but there's also you know, many, many striking moments where I feel like I'm looking at my home mountains somewhere where I'm in the Arabian Peninsula. And so you, you have these glimpses of connection, but then you also realize that they're, they're very different places. And I mean, even my hometown of Tucson, it's, it's a semi-arid semi desert. And there's other zones that, that you can find that are dunes. There are, uh, somebody mentioned, uh, Katrin mentioned forests that she's studying before. There are forest zones. And those are also some of the, some of the earliest um, uh, lands that the University of Arizona was given through the land grant system were forests. And those were some of actually the first ones that the University of Arizona sold off because uh, that, 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 that timber was incredibly valuable when they got those parcels back in, back, back in the day. Um, so there are many different ways that you can think about the desert. Um, and, and I think this, this kind of imagination of that is, is what's so powerful. And this, the, the cover image here, this comes from a 1975 Arizona Highways um, magazine cover. And in it, it's all about the sort of techno futures of uh, solar power and, and all of these new exciting developments being cast in the desert. And of course, it's a fictional image. I mean, the thank, thank, thank you to the, the, the family of the, uh, of the artist who gave us the permission to use this. Uh, but it's, it's, still, it's still an imagination. Um, and and that I think is is for me what is so powerful about this story that it is it is it, it somehow does not have an essence but it is almost always somehow other. Um, that's a very fluid way of answering your question, but in general, <laughs> arid. <laughs> yeah. been wondering the story about cowboys and Indians mm -hmm. and, you, and what you call a mythology and realizing that you don't want to have any part in that mm -hmm. anymore. Mm -hmm. How did that impact this notion, well, of home? And secondly, what is, so, so to speak, the, the practical upshot for reimagining the desert of, say, Tucson? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think at the, at the heart of the book is this is this just shocking realization how invisible this history was to me as a child. And of course, you know, I've, I've worked with a, a, a lot of indigenous scholars, in, including one, one scholar who I've spoken with a lot over the course of this project and who Bobby Lee also met when we had this meeting. Uh, our first meeting is Andrew Curley. He's Diné. Um, he didn't have that upbringing, right? Uh, this, this kind of, 
this kind of thing is not something he ever would have experienced. Um, and, and so talking with him and other indigenous colleagues and friends, you understand that, that this, is, this is about this kind of colonial project, but the colonial project was something that I wasn't taught to reflect on, but that they did not have the privilege not to reflect on. Um, so, so for me, this was a really important part of, yeah, I mean, it's, it's really, truly painful when you, when you start to realize this, but you also understand that, that this, is, this is just a normal way that many white people in Arizona think, and, and they, they still continue to dress up their kids like this. Like, there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with this in any popular imagination within Arizona. Um, th this is just something that, that kids, kids should be dressed up as. Um, so, so in this then, I, I think this, this took me back to, and, and I think um, Veronica mentioned this, this uh, sorry if I've gotten this wrong, so, somebody mentioned that I did made this uh, encounter with the archives of one of my predecessors at Syracuse University, um, George Babcock Cressy, a very famous uh, geographer from the 1930s to, to until he died in the 1960s. Uh, and, and discovering that I was also then interested in exactly the same farm in Saudi Arabia where he had gone in the 1950s, and I thought that we geographers today were somehow doing something radically different, uh, but, but discovering that I was sort of looping myself back in the same way, um, but in an academic sense. So just constantly reflecting on, I think this image in a, in a lot of ways is useful for me to just keep a reality check and to constantly be reflecting on, well, what is my position today? Am I necessarily keeping the same critical perspective that I now can take to looking at these photos, um, but just reflecting that in my academic praxis and in the way that I then interrogate my sources, uh, how I tell a story, all, all of those questions about focus are, are, are really quite important, I think, in, in reflecting on, on some, of this, um, some of this history. Right, well then I will make an executive decision to invite you all to, to some food in the back. Um, thank you again for coming and I, I hope to meet you all very soon if we've not met already.